Welcome to Psychology to Live By, and today is a Q and A with with a group of uh, of friends uh, who uh, have the distinction of being Canadians, and uh, our topic today is the unflappable happiness of being average. And our lovely participants have watched the podcast with that name, which you can see or listen to at my website, Dr. Chris. Life. But I'll do a quick summary now before we march into our Q&A. Some years ago, I asked a quite large audience of creatives if they were happy to be average. They were not, of course, and they weren't too happy with me asking that question. But the truth is, we are all, on average, average on most things. But we've got a superiority bias where we tend to overrate ourselves on most things. So this word average has indeed often come to mean something closer to bad or poor. So it creates insecurity when it's true, when we're not as good as we or other people may think we are. This creates a very pervasive ego trap where we try to disguise our shortcomings and this causes untold suffering. The antidote to this is solid self-esteem that's based on diligence applied to important tasks and by seeking and applying honest feedback from people we respect. It's built on the back of a growth mindset where attention is trained on the task, not on how we're looking. And it's deepened by relaxing unrealistic standards and slowly and continuously improving and thereby truly earning our successes. All right, that's enough of a, uh, of a summary. And so let's turn to our Q&A. And, and he, here are my Canadian friends. Uh, and as usual, I'm, I'm very curious about what you took from the podcast. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Who wants to kick off? <laughs> so, um, in the in I think in the latter part towards the end, you sort of talk about um, some of the things that uh, people get concerned of thinking externally. So, I think the exact example is you use is like a reputation. A good reputation doesn't drive happiness, but at the opposite yes. end of that, a bad reputation can drive unhappiness. Correct. Um, and I'm going to cringeworthy quote Kanye West here there's a line in the song that says having money is not everything not having it is right and so there's this uh how do we reconcile possibly you know these like overarching things that might be social um and not necessarily tied to the esteem of important people like, I guess, I guess my question is you can have both. You could have these factors that are driving unhappiness from sort of that public esteem side. And then these factors driving happiness from the core people that matter to you that don't care about that, all that other stuff. Like, how do you, how do we live in that balance and reconcile that? As is usual with this group, curly <laughs> questions. Uh, so there's quite a lot to this. Um, the got to step back a little bit what, what why do we care so much and um evolutionary psychology has a lot to say about this you know the basic view is that we need status we need esteem from the village and that this has this has deep roots in our, in our very design architecture in other words we survived as a species by being able to cooperate and within the village if, if we have higher status it probably means we're going to be provisioned first and we're going to live long enough to, to mate and pass on our genes, right? So at the deepest possible levels in our brain structure, our hormone systems, the whole enchilada, um, we're, we're designed to care about what people think, mm -hmm. okay? And just by, and by the by, evolution's not interested in our happiness, right? So uh, these drives are very deep, Right, but they're not necessarily going to make us happy. Right now, of course, it's almost impossible to be happy if you're starving. 
So, you know, uh, Kanye West's insight there is, you know, and in fact, there are empirical studies of that, that when you look at people's income, which, which by the way, income is a kind of measure of our esteem in the village. In the Stone Age, there wouldn't have been currency except for status and, and esteem levels. And pretty much once you're past a survival level of income, um, income operates as a sort of status measure, which really tickles all of our our circuits, right? And but yeah, the, so the research shows that up to a certain level of income, money, extra money makes you happier, but then it, and then it levels off, right? And uh, so, in other words, there is a happiness is a different uh, thing to. Um, you know, will I survive and, and so on? Maybe a, a lack of happiness does not mean happiness and vice versa. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. A lack of unhappiness doesn't it? Yeah, because there's something more, there's another purpose in life that we have to construct. It's not necessarily one that comes through evolution. It, it comes from noticing, because we've got reflexive intelligence, it comes from noticing that that um, there are certain things in life that intrinsically make me feel joyous or happy, you know, things like relationship, things like contributing, uh, being altruistic. We're definitely wired for that. Things like aesthetic appreciation of beauty, um, even just physical well-being, you know, being in the world. So how do we cultivate those things, you know? Um, but, yeah, so it a massive question there but um what i was getting at there is a difference between a thing called pseudo esteem mm -hmm. and and real esteem and uh pseudo esteem has to be managed now what i mean by pseudo esteem is esteem from people who don't really know us so that would that would include reputation for example you know, I have a reputation, you know, probably unwarranted as a reasonable psychologist. Uh, and, you know, I can trade on that. It can it can be valuable. But it'd be very foolish of me to take it too seriously, like to internalise it as, as in terms of self-image and identity, right? So it's more that that we're looking at. Once we get past survival, what we're looking for is getting our internal appraisal as close to actual reality as we can. And, and there's an assumption that, that I make, and people might disagree with me, and that is that the human happiness is largely a function of being in sync with reality. Mental ill health is, is when we get out of sync with reality. You know, we might be too negative about ourselves or too positive. You know, it might be narcissistic or really depressive, right? So how do we get closer in, in sync, we get feedback from people whose judgment and motives we trust so that we can recalibrate our own distortions around self. But we also engage very um, diligently, rigorously on the fundamentals of whatever we're doing. We don't cut corners. So when we do get success, we can naturally and correctly feel pride, knowing without a shadow of doubt we've earned it. So there's no gap there between our success and our honest self-appraisal. It's a quite a long answer, Chris, but it was a, 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 a nuanced question. Mm. What else, guys? I think we're doing such a disservice to, um, not everybody, but to our kids. You know, you had mentioned earlier mm. that, um, you know, parents tend to feel that their kids are, above average or they yeah, push the, 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 the lake wobbegon effect yes all that all the kids are above average <laughs> <laughs> and then you know they may be in this really contained environment and maybe they are above average in that contained environment but once they start to grow up and they move on to yes a much yes. larger the rest of the world it's crushing for them yes i don't know how to deal with it so Carol, Professor Carol Dweck from Stanford, in her famous work around mindsets, talks about this quite a lot. Um, and her view is that kids can develop what she calls a fixed mindset. And that is they've been overpraised with what she calls trait feedback or trait praise. Yeah, just a little bit, 
the psychology there. So a trait is something that's permanent about us. And a state is, is our changeable states as we go through every day. Her view is that if, if kids are saturated or marinated, you know, in, in kind of trait praise, like you're brilliant, you're smart, you're beautiful, these permanent attributes, they begin to fit, think of themselves as kind of set, as, as fixed, right? Which is all fine if, if they're a big fish in a small pond, but when they get out in the white in, in the big wide ocean and there's you know whales and and white sharks etc all of a sudden there's a brittleness you know they don't have that the cognitive and emotional flexibility and so what do we do as parents we focus our praise and our criticism on tasks and process, not on the kid, right? For the kid, if you praise their process, it's still it's still like a sugar hit. It's lovely. They like it, right? But it doesn't, doesn't carry this implication that it's something fixed about their nature. It keeps turning their attention to what they did and the effect of what they did and then a suggestion for what they can do in the future. The same applies in workplaces, in giving feedback, that we should always give feedback that's sort of depersonalised in this way, very focused on. Now, and why is that helpful? Apart from not developing this kind of fixed mindset idea, um, I think that human happiness, a huge part of it anyway, can be equated with what I call the relative lack of self-concern or even just self-consciousness or self-monitoring, right? So to the extent that we're not thinking about self, we're going to be pretty happy. But as soon as self comes into our view, it seems to cloud out the world. Yeah, very good. What else, guys? That's, I just, you've just revolutionized parenting for me, Dr. Chris. Thank you for that. <laughs> Focusing on the task and the process opposed to the trait, right? Like that's, um, yeah. that I can, it just, it absolutely connects with um, the thought of like sending your kids out into the adult world. And like you said, all of a sudden they're a little fish in that, in the big sea, how, um, if you are focusing on congratulating or praising the task, there's a more of a connection with, with what they're doing opposed to who they are. And then I can see how that self-knowledge and self-acceptance building to that pride, how that would be more easily attained that way. So thank you for that. It's my pleasure. And while you were talking, it just reminded me, uh, there's a wonderful book called The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. And uh, in which he, he looks at um, sort of the world's best in a, in, in a, in a whole variety of fields. And he, he, he's basically examining what is it about them that makes them the best. And it's a fascinating book. It's quite easy to read. And he talks a lot about myelin, which is this fatty substance that coats our axons and dendrites in the brain. But the idea is when we practice something really, really well with, with very mindful attention, and practice it imperfectly, we coat these connections with myelin and, and our neural systems fire more reliably and faster and so on, a bit like insulation, right? But what, he, what he's honing in on is that these people, uh, they were talented, but they probably weren't the most talented when they were younger. What, what distinguishes them is the way they practice, and he calls it deep practice. And the way they practice is this, almost obsessive, you know, sort of perfectionistic striving where they're focusing on the task and they're actually looking for errors that they can sl slightly improve. But the, it's all done in this context of not um, about how I'm going to look to others, but a real intrinsic fascination and passion about what they're doing. Right, and that's the real key here. Um, at, at least in that domain, a person can be above average if, if they do that because they'll just get better and better and better, all right? 
Whereas that fixed mindset puts a ceiling on what people can achieve because they're not going to venture any in their, in their head. Failure is going to diminish who they are. Whereas someone with, with a growth mindset, it's going to show them an avenue for improvement. And so it's exciting, right? Completely different psychology. Fantastic. So Dr. Chris, Yes, why Tony. as, or it's my, in my, my case, why as I get older, do I not care anything about reputation or care less and less about, about reputation? Yeah. And the fact that probably the majority of my reputation is, has been built through the perception of others and not through the perception of myself. So okay. why do I care less and less as I get older about it? So there is a, um, it's, it's by no means universal that as we get older, we care less, but um, it certainly is a trend, okay? And so part of the reason is that over the lifespan, we have so many thousands or perhaps millions of uh, pieces of feedback that, that gradually, uh, I think a couple of things happen. You know, one would be that we become a bit more closely calibrated to reality. So we kind of know who we are. And so if someone has a view that's different to mine and I don't really rate or respect their judgment, they may not have insight into me, then it's not going to impact, you know, because I've built a more solid sense of self. The other one is a bit more speculative, but it is, it is, it's my view, it's in my opinion, and, and that is that as we get older, potentially, and this is not by – you may not be typical in this, Terry, right? Um, is that potentially as we get older, we begin to transcend somewhat this evolutionary driven need for, for esteem and status from the village. Remember, that was, that was, that's driven fundamentally by the need to survive and pass on our genes. But there's something, I think, more fundamental, more, more, more deep, uh, perhaps even more spiritual as we get older and that is that um, we can drop some of the ego concerns and the ego needs because after all the ego is not a real thing it's a construction necessitated by our biology but it's not a there's, there's no ego in here and again ultimately we can be more relaxed when we're not having to defend ego or even even think about it too much yeah yeah all i want to do is be average yeah me too it, it, that's that. That's why I called it the unflappable happiness of being average. You know, because there's nowhere to fall. <laughs> is it is it fair to also say then a big part of this is building up your capacity for acceptance of in, in some ways? Yeah, totally. Like, acceptance of self, but maybe is the best yeah. way of putting it, and and knowing who you are yeah. and what you're good at and what you're not good at, and being okay with that. Totally. Um, in a different context, I, I, I constructed a parable. I call it the, um, the universal delusion. And, and the universal delusion is this thing where pretty much everyone feels like they're not good enough. That there's, you know, in the Christian tradition, it might be that there's some sort of original sin. But for, just generally for folk, that there's some sort of deficit in here or stain or, you know, and uh, it is a delusion, but it's a it's a, an entirely um, universal one because you scratch almost anyone in the right place, you'll find this insecurity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that realizing gradually over time that it is a delusion, that everything's actually okay, that I'm good enough. And, and, and I, I draw a distinction here between a person's being and their doing. And I think that, you know, uh, I happen to know, Chris, you have young children mm -hmm. and uh, you, would, you would have vivid memories of them being babes in arms. Mm -hmm. And unless you're psychologically damaged goods, as you're gazing down into the eyes of that babe in arms, you're going to spontaneously and naturally have feelings of of love and awe right yeah 
it's not because that babe in arms is doing anything. You know, they're not speaking yet. They're not reciting poetry. You know, they haven't written a, you know a musical hit. Uh, no, in fact, that, that, that's crazy talk. You know, that's category mistake because that would say a person only deserves love and and and, and or if they do something special. Right, traditional. But of course, so our, our nature is that baby's nature in that we all deserve exactly that amount of love and awe just in, just by being, you know, and it's in our nature. So it's kind of like a returning to, to a self-appreciation mm -hmm. of our fundamental nature, which can't be improved upon. Then we're freed up to play in the world in what we do but not with this heavy load that I need to do this stuff in order to be lovable or in order to be okay. So that again, it's this transcending of these very natural and important ego needs. But, you know, I, I sometimes think of them as like trainer wheels that you put on a, on a kid's bike. And at some point they, they, they learn the distinction balance and you can take the trainer wheels off. Well, I think for human beings, these ego needs are our trainer wheels. But unfortunately, most people never take them off. <laughs> that, just means, that just means that you can ride the bike with no hands. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's it. That's even the next. That's the next step, isn't it? Um, and then maybe how can you ride with no bike? But anyway, we're we're getting <laughs> silly. Um, so, guys, thank you so much uh, for your time and, as usual, for the depth of your insights and questions. And I look forward to the next occasion uh, when we uh, will we'll do another Q&A. Thanks, guys, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. See you.